Okay, so uh, here we are at the Picmonic Sound Booth, um, getting ready to start for our heart failure webinar. Um, and first off, you're going to say, why in the world am I wearing this crazy hat? Um, so this is our Picmonic dunce hat um, of the day. And um, we had some problems with our audio uh, when we ran this webinar live. So we are actually re-recording it, a good version, with the video so you actually get the full experience of the webinar. And I was forced to wear this um, wonderful um, wildling dunce hat um, that they made me wear. So I'm going to sneak this off so that they actually don't um, get this and we're going to go ahead and get started. So today's we this webinar is going to be a little bit shorter than normal so we don't have um, as much interaction but I'm still going to kind of pause to um, get you to check those and see how it goes. So we're going to go ahead and get started on a webinar on heart failure and um, the cardiovascular system. So um, when you think about the cardiovascular system, or first off rather, um, just an introduction about me. Uh, my name is Kendall Wyatt. Um, I'm a nurse, an RN, um, as well as a paramedic, and I'm in my third year of medical school here in the Phoenix Valley. And we're broadcasting again live um, where this is being recorded um, in our um, Tempe office, Tempe, Arizona, inside of our Picmonic sound booth where we actually record all of our Picmonics uh, for our learning system. Um, for Picmonic, I'm an instructional content strategist, so I kind of help um, design or come up with a lot of our nursing topics and our nursing education product along with our other nursing scholars, um, as well as doing a lot of stuff with our iOS, um, Apple apps, um, and whatnot, a little bit on the tech side. So um, without further ado, we're going to go over and we're going to say, um, what are we going to cover today on this particular webinar? And um, we're going over the cardiovascular system as a whole. Um, yes, we're focusing on the heart failure, um, but we're going over the cardiovascular system in general. And the, one of the important things you really want to understand um, when thinking about this is understanding the concepts. So to get the concepts, you first have to always understand the basics. Um, and as periodically, I always take a little drink to keep my mouth from getting too dry from my beautiful Picmonic cup. So you'll see that from time to time as well. Uh, a little bit of extra branding there, right? So um, we want to understand the basics of the cardiovascular system, and I have a great way of breaking down exactly how you really want to think about the basics and how to get that. We're going to go over how blood flow goes through the body, and we, that the blood flow only goes one way, and then we're going to actually dive in and go into heart failure itself as far as the heart failure, um, different types, the assessments, and the interventions. At the end, we're going to do a quick review. And then um, normally we do a Q&A at uh, e the end of the, a quick Q&A in each webinar um, so that you can reach out to really um, interact with us and see if there's any problems. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we want to do is we want to really understand the components of the cardiovascular system. And part of that is knowing the normal blood flow. And I really broke this down into a simple way for you to understand into three main parts. Um, after that, we're really going to focus on identifying the problem area and understanding that the blood flow always backs up because blood flow always goes one direction, right? If blood flow is going the wrong direction, we end up with problems, and that's always um, the way you need to think about it and the concept that we're going to go over today to really solidify this in for you. Um, and then we're going to go over the interventions, and the interventions are really going to tie in and link in these concepts, of understanding the concept and linking it in with exactly um, what's going on. So throughout this entire learning webinar today, we actually have lots and lots and lots of graphics. And every single graphic, aside from this beautiful one here in the bottom right of myself, um, is that it does tie to an actual character. So when you see um, a, a fever beaver, or a beaver rather, you're going to think that it's a fever. And you're going to be able to see these throughout the entire webinar that actually tie back into our learning system um, that we actually kind of tie in those components to help you solidify your memory. So let's look first at the actual blood flow through the body. Now this is not a very beautiful image, but what you can see here is that blood flow does go from capillaries, small tiny capillaries, to veins of venules to the vena cava. And that's deoxygenated blood, as you can see by it, it's blue, and um, in blue text. And the vena cava goes into the right side of the heart. And in the right side of the heart, we know that blood flow from the right side goes where? That's right, the right side into the lungs. And it goes into the lungs. And what happens in the lungs? Think about it. In the lungs, the blood flow goes in there, and it picks up its little oxygen molecules, and it gathers them. And once it's got its oxygen on the hemoglobin, then it can go out of the lungs into the pulmonary uh, vein and into the left, the left uh, atrium and left side of the heart. 
And once it goes from the left side of the heart, it goes back out into the body. And when it goes to the body, it goes to these muscular arteries. Why are they muscular arteries? Because they're pumping out this um, to the entire body system. The right side of the heart, it's a lazy side of the heart. It only has to pump blood flow from the right side into the lungs. That's not very far. I mean, lazy thing. The left side of the heart, though, has to pump from the left side all the way through the entire body, and that's why the arteries are very muscular so that it can maintain this high pressure to keep things going forward. So when we think about the cardiovascular system, what I want you to think are three simple things. That's it. This is as simple as it gets. I broke it down really easy for you. I want you to think of three parts, a pipes, a pump, and a tank. And when I think of um, a tank, I want you to think of a tank and the fluid in the tank. So pipes, pump, and a tank. And one thing that you're going to always notice is that I repeat things constantly, constantly, constantly repeating. And that's what you want is you always want to have this repetition, repetition, repetition uh, outside of uh, – to always reinforce your learning so that you know exactly what's going on. So pipes, pump, and tank or the fluid, and that's definitely what you need to uh, understand. Um, so let's look at it. Pipes, pump, and tank or the fluid, tank and fluid. So pipes are the pipes. So uh, what, what, what do you mean you think about when you think pipes? Uh, pipes inside the body, well, those are pipes. They carry things, and they move things from one place to the other, and that's what we want to think of like veins and arteries. Pump, of course, what about a pump? Well, the pump is the heart. It's the muscular thing that's in there beating, 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 and it's pushing the blood flow from the pump into the body, inside the tank, through the pipes. And the next thing is the tank and the fluid. So the tank itself actually holds – that's the whole body. So inside this whole body, this whole system, um, is the tank, and that tank then, in fact, has pipes um, that move the fluid throughout it. And we have to think of these as three cohesive things. So if there's a problem with the pipes, the pump can help pick up and help, help, it, help it along. The tank and the fluid um, – the fluid can then – if there's a problem, the pump or the pipes can help adapt or compensate, and that's how you need to think about this to really understand the concept of how one works with the other. Because if we think about the tank and we think about blood, we know that the blood itself has um, red blood cells and whatnot inside of the blood, and those red blood cells carry hemoglobin, and hemoglobin carries oxygen. So if you have really bad blood, then it's going to have a problem, and that's the way you need to think. Pipes can vasodilate and move things. And let's look at a couple of – let's look at these three very basic concepts, one, two, three. So if we look at them, uh, we're going to try to actually um, understand the components here of these three areas. So if I go forward, this is the normal blood flow. Let's look at our simplified version. So if I look at the tank and the fluid, that's one of the three components. What is something you should be thinking about if you had an empty tank? So if I had an empty tank, what is something that is a cause of an empty tank? Think about it. An empty tank. If you had an empty tank, I just said empty tank is tank and fluid, and fluid is blood, so that's a patient who has hypovolemia. Hypovolemia, low blood loss, hemorrhage, somebody's bleeding out. They're going to have a low tank volume, so that's why we give those patients fluid replacement. But what about dehydration? Something that you have to know about dehydration is the fact that with dehydration, it's a decreased fluid volume overall. And if I go – if I think about the three areas, the pipes, the pump, and the tank, if you're dehydrated, which one of those – what's the very first sign or symptom that you're going to immediately think of when you think of dehydration? Dehydration, every single patient with dehydration presents with what? I think you probably said it, tachycardia. That's the number one sign of dehydration right away, aside from thirst and whatnot, but you're going to see patients with dehydration with tachycardia because the pump itself actually compensates for that low tank volume to circulate the tank volume faster. So that the, what, what's the ultimate goal here? Keep the tissues oxygenated. That's exactly the way you need to be thinking conceptually to understand to put it all together. Now, maybe you have oil in a car where you can have you know, blood in, in your body's tank, and it could be bad. It could be no good. And that means it's circulating just fine, but it's very poor uh, fluid, bad fluid, like anemia. It's not oxygenated well enough. Maybe there's not enough red blood cells or something like sepsis where there's just you know, serious systemic infection and, um, and whatnot. And we're going to actually go over um, a respiratory – we have a respiratory entire concept webinar we're going to be doing um, to help you master this as well. So moving forward, bad pipes. 
So let's think about bad pipes. And if I have bad pipes, well, bad the pipes actually kind of keep they can they can kind of constrict or constrict and vasodilate right inside of the pipes. So big giant pipes means a low pressure. Very tiny little pipes are high pressure. So if I took um, if I took a straw, so I got my, my beautiful straw here, and I blow through the straw, and I blow really hard, I can put a really high pressure through that tiny straw. But if I took a big old pipe, a giant pipe, maybe a three-inch PVC pipe, and I tried to blow through it, do I get a high pressure through that pipe, the big vasodilated pipe? No. And that's maybe where vasodilation, or um, you can have patients in um, neurogenic shock um, who have vasodilation, and they end up with um, very, very low blood pressures because they can't vasoconstrict to increase the blood pressure. And this is one of my favorite characters, which you see throughout Pygmonic, which is a hippo for hypo and tension for the blood pressure cuff. So that's definitely something. As well as trauma, trauma patient, um, you're going to see those as well. Um, but not necessarily usually because of bad pipes, but because of trauma, because maybe they hemorrhaged and they have um, low uh, volume. And you need to think about these three, how they work together. And that's how you need to be thinking about these. How do the three work together? Because they're a, they're a three-part unit. You can't have one without the other two. If one's a problem, the other two are definitely helping out. Maybe you have um, a poor pump. Well, you're going to vasoconstrict, and maybe you're going to um, increase fluid volume to compensate, to help increase, ultimately, cardiac output. And that's the way you need to think about this. So what about heart failure or pump failure, right? So we had our pipes, we had our tank, and now we have a pump failure. That's the topic of what we're going to go over today, pump failure. So what are some common causes of pump failure? So I got my heart. What's going to cause it to, to actually fail? Think about it for a second. Well, I mean, problems where the heart just dies, right? Like a myocardial infarction. That's definitely something. Um, valvular heart disease. So uh, we think of um, patients who have valvular heart diseases like mitral valve prolapse, um, where it's a problem with regurgitation. We have a problem with aortic stenosis in many elderly patients where the aortic valve actually doesn't, um, where it causes a, a fluid buildup and it ends up causing pump failure. And um, cardiomyopathies. And I I said this earlier, but you think of cardio, you think cardiac, cardiac. Myo means muscle, and pathy means a pathologic disease process. So some actual pathologic disease process of the cardiac muscle itself. And mayo means muscle, if I didn't say that correctly. So cardiomyopathy, actually problems, disease problems with the actual muscle. That's exactly um, what you need to be thinking about here. And I'm just going to... tweak this up just for a second. Hopefully I um, didn't show that a little too crazy. Uh, but uh, it's, So that hopefully will fix the um, display. So uh, anyway, so a cardiomyopathy. Now, the last one I did mention in the list here was um, hypertension. So if I have hypertension, um, hypertension, high blood pressure, why would hyper blood, or high blood pressure, hyper blood pressure, I can't even think, um, high blood pressure cause um, heart failure? Why is it going to cause pump to fail? Think about it for a second. A high blood pressure. Why? And I love this little character, my hiker BP. So this is a high. In Pickmonic, we always use a hiker, um, hiker BP, high blood pressure. Why? Let's think about it. Why well, I broke it down for you. And this is kind of a concept in itself, but I just want to just quickly go over it so that you really master exactly what's going on. So let's look at this. So if I have a normal blood pressure, beautiful blood pressure, you have 120 over 80. Yeah, that's nice. I love 120 over 80 blood pressure. That's a beautiful blood pressure. So if I think about the top number, 120, here's the bottom number, 80. 120 is the systolic, so that's systolic. So I think about that's that's the contraction, and I see that systolic is the contraction, and that's the actual contraction of the heart muscle, and that's the ejection, the amount of, of fluid that ejects from the left ventricle every time, and that's our stroke volume. See how it's going across this line? And that's the actual amount that ejects every time the heart muscle contracts. So that makes sense. Um, that's 120. That's a beautiful number. That's the amount of force that needs to overcome to eject that fluid out and create my stroke volume. And of course, um, I'm going to get to a couple of other things in just a second. So the bottom number, the diastolic number, bottom number is 80. So if the systolic number at the top is with contraction of the, the heart muscle and the amount ejected out, then we have the um, diastolic number of the amount at rest. Excuse me. So 80. So what that means is I've contracted systole, but then I relax because every every contraction ends up with a relaxation. So when the left ventricle relaxes, then that's the diastole or diastolic pressure. 
And what that is is that's the amount of rest. That's the pressure at rest. And um, it should be hopefully around 80 or 80 to 100 is the normal range, right? And we know there's pre-hypertension, hypertension, and whatnot. But we, a beautiful number, if we had to pick one, would be 80. And we know if whatever volume left inside of that left ventricle is then the residual volume, the amount that's left inside of there, um, for you to really um, to, to see that the – backing up a sec just so I don't uh, get this confused. So it's the amount – um, the, the systolic then is the amount that has to overcome this resting pressure. So if the pressure is always 80 inside of the left ventricle, then I know that I have to overcome 80, and I have to eject over top of there to open up the aortic valve, open it up to eject that amount out into the aorta and then out into the body. So this is the number at the bottom is the rest number, but I have to overcome that, overcoming it with a top number. So if I looked on the right, on the far right of here, then I can see that these these high numbers, this is a very high blood pressure. So if I looked at the top number, 160, that means I have to be a very, very high number, a very high number that I have to increase to go over top of the resting to eject, to open up the aorta, aortic valve to eject the, um, the blood out into the aorta and then to the body, right? And if I think then the resting, the diastolic pressure, the bottom number, well, if the resting number is high, that means the heart never gets to rest. So what happens is these patients with high blood pressure constantly over time, well, one, it never gets to rest, and the blood pressure has to constantly overcome not only the rest but then above to go above and beyond to keep pushing over. And if you see this correlation between the top and the bottom, stroke volume versus residual volume, well, you know that the difference between that hopefully is the ejection fraction. It's the percentage of volume that ejects with each with each particular contraction. And you can kind of – if you understand this concept, you can really master a lot of things around hypertension um, as well. And I'm not really wanting to go way too in-depth in with that, so I hope I didn't um, really get you. But if you think of systolic heart failure, well, that's heart failure that can't contract hard enough. Diastolic heart failure is just heart failure that it can't rest, so it rests way too much. Um, and that's just a kind of general concept there as well. So let's just move on. So we're really going to focus on now where the problem areas are, so where the fl blood flow actually backs up. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually focus on the three types of heart failure, right, left, and high output. Um, and um, we're going to go over left heart failure first, and this is just a picmonic image of the different types of heart failure um, to help you remember which one goes with what. And we're going to go over those in just a minute. So left-sided heart failure. If I think of left-sided heart failure, um, I want you to think that there's congestion behind the problem. So if the left side of the heart is failing, that means fluid is backing up behind the left side of the heart. So hmm, let's think about that. You should be thinking right now what the answer is now. Uh, if I look at this, here's a, a full image of what the blood flow is through, um, through the body. Capillaries, venial veins, vena cava. This is all deoxygenated blood into the right side of the heart to the lungs. From the lungs, it picks up its oxygen inside the lungs. Hey, I got my oxygen, and here I go into the pulmonary vein and into the left side of the heart. When I'm in the left side of the heart, you can see here I've outlined this box for you. These are what fail in left-sided heart failure. The left atria, the mitral valve, the left ventricle, or the aortic valve. One of these problems uh, presents as an issue, and then it keeps uh, the blood flow here is where the problem is, and it backs up behind it. So where is the problem with left-sided heart failure? You can see as we go forward, um, this is our left-sided heart failure pycmonic, just to kind of show you where we're going with some of these images, um, and it causes pulmonary congestion because behind the left side of the heart are the lungs. The oxygen goes from – or the, sorry, the blood goes from the right side of the heart to the lungs, and inside of the lungs, it picks up the oxygen. Hey, lungs, how you doing? Give me the oxygen. I'm back to the – I'm going back to the, the left side of the heart. Going back to the left side of the heart and then out to the body. So if the problem is actually at – and here I've got a great – um, image. If the problem – here's the exact same thing I just showed you a minute ago. Um, if the problem is in the left side of the heart, blood flow goes from the capillaries, veins, vena cava, right side of the heart, to the lungs where it picks up oxygen and then goes to the left side of the heart. Here, if the left side of the heart is dead, shown by this little left-sided dead heart here, and behind – all the stuff behind here, it backs up. Fluid increases back there. Hey, there's – it's not enough to go before. Roadblock. Well, what happens anytime there's a traffic accident on any major highway, right? The, the interstate, there's a traffic accident, and traffic backs up behind it. And what happens with traffic backs up behind it? It builds up and slow, and there's a problem. There's a lot of it, and that's exactly what you need to think here. Left side of the heart, boom, there's the lungs. The lungs are definitely the problem. 
So everything you see with left-sided heart failure immediately, like the, the quickest, is going to be involving the lungs. Now, here's an important concept. Let's think about this. Well, behind the lungs, what's behind the lungs? Well, the right side of the heart. So it's natural to think that left-sided heart failure causes right-sided heart failure eventually. Not immediately, but eventually, right? And then causes other problems behind it. So let's look at left-sided heart failure again. Behind it, so here's the problem, lungs, going to be congestion, fluid buildup, as shown here, this little image. But ahead of the lungs, after, or ahead of the left side of the heart, left side of the heart goes into the aorta, which then goes to the body and all of the organs. Are they getting lots of blood pressure? No, they're not getting lots of, they're not getting, they're getting very, they're getting or lots of blood flow. No, they have a decreased blood flow. And compensatory mechanisms have to make up for that. And that's what you need to be thinking about. Uh, concept, concept, concept. Let's think about exactly what's going on so you understand how oxygenation works throughout the body. And when we go over just the lungs and respiratory, we're going to go over actually um, in a couple of weeks. We're going to go over how lungs, how the respiratory system works with those with the lungs, so you know exactly what's going on. So um, moving forward, so we have um, pulmonary ingestion. Lungs are backed up, and lots of things here are going on. And this is where we're actually going to show you. Um, our picmonic images. So I want to just kind of um, introduce some of these picmonic characters so that you can always remember it because they're just lots of fun. Um, I actually used picmonic when I was in um, studying for USMLE Step One, um, and I'm currently uh, in my third year rotations as a physician. Um, so I'm actually, you know, I this is how I actually came onto picmonic. So we didn't have picmonic for nursing, and this is where I actually really am so excited to help bring some of these images to you. So here's a left-sided heart. What do we see? Well, we see these congested lungs, right? Anytime you see this picmonic, you're going to see these congested lungs. And if you think about lungs and pulmonary congestion, well, what are all the things that go along with pulmonary congestion? You have a patient. What is the number one you're going to see? Well, I've already skipped ahead here to give you this pink frothy sputum. Now, why, why, why do you have pink frothy sputum? I want you to think about that. Just think about it. Why? Now, I'm going to take a drink here from my picmonic beautiful cup. Pink frothy sputum. So if you have pink frothy sputum, think about where, why, how you get sputum. That sputum is coming from the lungs, ultimately, and it's pink tinged because inside of the lungs, this fluid is building up. See this congestion here? That fluid backs up into the lungs, but what are the lungs doing? The lungs are actually bringing blood flow in from a, um, into venules and, and arteries, and it's oxygenating that, and it's doing it at the alveoli. alveoli. And inside those alveoli, if the pressure backs up so they can't get that blood flow out of there, well, then what happens? Well, exactly what happens. A little bit of blood ends up into the respiratory tract, and that causes the normal sputum to become pink, a little bit pink-tinged, and that's where you're going to see this pink, frothy sputum. So I just told you pulmonary congestion. What are some respiratory signs and symptoms you're going to see? Well, you're going to see wheezing as this little weasel here, wheezing. You're going to see crackles as shown by these little crackers. Um, and this is wheezing, crackles. Well, what do crackles mean? Crackles are any time that the alveoli, alveolar sacs are actually opening up with fluid inside of them. So they make that little that little noise um, so that you know that those are crackles when you listen to them. Um, and you see a patient with crackles, and you know this left, you know, this pulmonary, some type of pulmonary edema, fluid buildup inside of the lungs. And when you think about this, um, every patient with left-sided heart failure is going to have dyspnea. And what specific indicator. If we talked about a patient, and I, I gave you a, this scenario um, of a patient, what is the scenario of a patient that you're going to think of that you need to be um, especially clued into heart failure and pulmonary edema? What type of patient? It's a patient who lies supine. Any patient who's um, lying supine is going to have more difficulty breathing. And what do we call that um, difficulty breathing when you lie supine? It's called orthopnea, orthopnea. So that means um, when you lie supine, you have difficulty breathing. And what is a really important assessment finding that you always need to think about, very high yield for any patient when you think of heart failure, um, especially left-sided heart failure, to understand, hey, hi, um, Mary Smith, how you doing? Um, what would I ask Mary Smith to find out maybe a level of how bad her heart failure is um, to kind of just assess as a nurse how would I assess that? Well, maybe I would ask her what? 
I'd ask her exactly how many pillows maybe she sleeps on at night. That's what I might want to ask her. How many pillows do you sleep on at night, Mary Smith? Because if we know that she needs to prop up because she has um, difficulty breathing at night or um, as it's medically termed um, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or um, intermittent paroxysmal nocturnal at night dyspnea difficulty breathing, um, that's definitely how we would be able to tell what's going on with it. So dyspnea. Um, we like to show dyspnea in Picmonic as this disc P with lungs, and we always show them straining. It's always lots of fun, um, and you'll see all these characters cons consistently um, displayed throughout the entire Picmonic product, which is great. So if you have dyspnea, you might also have a patient with a cough, a patient who has a cough, and this cough is because of this sputum, this fluid buildup of pulmonary edema, and um, if, let's just stop right there and think about what is a very, very, very important – if I have a patient who has a persistent cough, what type of medication would I want to be thinking about to make sure asking what – hey, Mary Smith, you're having this cough all the time. What's a medication I need to be thinking about as a very high-yield side effect with a cough? What is that medication? Right, ACE inhibitors. If you have an ACE inhibitor medication, a pril, pril medication, if you think about – in Picmonic, we use a pearl for ACE inhibitors with an ACE card with inhibiting chains. Um, as a character you'll see later, um, always a very important side effect is a cough, and that's definitely an indication to stop that medication. But if you have a cough and you have this pink frothy, frothy sputum and Mary Smith's having some trouble where she has to lean up on some uh, pillows at night, then you want to think of heart failure, specifically left-sided heart failure. So with both left and right-sided heart failure, you're going to see you're going to see this. Um, we portray him as this sleepy guy, and sleepy guy is for fatigue or general fatigue. Um, they're tired, but why are they tired? Why would any patient be tired? If we think back, that's because these patients actually have a problem um, with um, cardiac output. Their cardiac output's decreased, and that's why they're tired all the time. I mean, if you can't have efficient cardiac output, you're going to be tired, and that's the, the soul of it. So here's the image of our left-sided heart failure pygmonic. And this um, assessment pygmonic um, goes through exactly everything I just went at a little bit faster pace, but it also has some additional information like tachycardia, as you'll see, because of compensatory mechanisms, S3 and S4 heart sounds, as well as generalized beat pulses. And you can find that inside of our Picmonic learning system. So let's take a second look at right-sided heart failure. Right-sided heart failure, the right side of the heart is failing. Seems simple enough, right? I mean, you guys are, should be masters by now. If I look at this beautiful drawing of all of the pieces, something you really should kind of conceptually understand, I see that it's going to come from the capillaries, from the body, basically, to the venules, to the veins, to the inferior superior vena cava, into the right side of the heart. So this is the part of the heart that's failing in right-sided heart failure, the right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, and the pulmonary valve or pulmonary semilunar valve. So if it fails here, then I know that the pressure is going to increase behind it. So it's going to build up where? Where is it going to build up? And let's look at it. Systemically. And how do we know that it's going to build up systemically? If I think about – I'm just going to go back for a sec. So if I think about here it's building up, then I know here it's going to increase my pressure in the inferior vena uh, – inferior and superior vena cava. It's going to increase my pressure in the veins, the venules, the arteries. What is one of the most important things I'm going to see right away in this systemic congested patient? What are you always going to see immediately? Peripheral edema, and that's right here, peripheral edema. You're going to see buildup in the patient in a peripheral manner, and not just peripheral. So, yeah, where is the buildup specifically going to be seen? What should we think about in these patients when you think of peripheral edema here with these right-sided heart failure patients? Peripheral, yes. I always like to think of right means rest of the body, um, the rest of the body, but specifically the feet. You need to be thinking about the feet. And the ankles. Think about cankles. And these patients, little old lady says, oh, my feet are swelling, my feet are swelling. Oh, my God. Well, that's because they may perhaps be thinking about right-sided heart failure. And it's specifically you need to be thinking about dependent edema. So if I take my hand, and I have my hand here. So is this a dependent note? Think? No. So if I think about my hand here and it's relaxed and it's down below, well, that means it's now dependent and it's relaxed down below. And that's because gravity then causes dependent um, or dependency. So that means that fluid then pulls below. Gravity pulls it down and causes a dependent edema. So what do we tell grandma with dependent edema? What's the number one thing we're going to tell her right away? Hey, you got cankles. What's something that's so easy? So easy. Okay, 
we need to raise the feet. Get down, get in your lazy chair, and raise your feet at night as much as possible, and maybe wear compression stockings. And that's something that's going to help that collateral circulation, increase that fluid back to the heart to help it um, decrease the um, circulation. So what are some other things we can see? We can see jugular venous distension, or JVD. Um, and so we think of jugular venous distension. I'm just going to go ahead and show you the characters with it. Um, so um, actually, sorry, I got a little, little ahead of myself. Um, so let's think about right side of heart failure and just show you again where it's going to be. Here's just the same image. Um, right side of the heart fails here, right? So what's going to build up? We need to think about higher pressure, build up fluid big in the built vena cava, both the vena cava, all the veins in the capillary, i.e. the body. So, but you also need to remember that there's the lungs, the left heart, and the arteries. Um, going forward to the body, the rest of the body, the, the oxygenated blood has a low output, and it, it's like a, I always like to use the term of like a water hose with really, um, really crappy flow. Um, so you, you have this water hose and the limp water hose, and it's just, a, just, you know, it's just this tiny little output. It's just trickling. But what is one thing you could do to increase the throughput? Well, you take your thumb and you put it over the end, and it increases and makes it spray really far. That's kind of the exact same thing when you think of the pipes, the pump and the tank. The pipes can constrict down um, to help increase that flow, and that's kind of a compensatory mechanism. So um, back where I was with JVD, jugular venous dissension. This is always one of my fun characters. So you can see this, um, this guy with his jug neck. He's got a jug for a neck, and he has these veins that are distended. So he's jug neck, jugular venous distension right here. Um, and um, peripheral edema, well, we always show any kind of edema as these um, edamame. So you can see these edamame here with these um, edematous feet and hands um, inside here. And an edamame, I didn't actually know what an edamame was until I um, actually used Picmonic for the first time. Um, slight embarrassment there, but that's where just coming from the country and not being quite so um, knowledgeable. So what about nocturia? Nocturia, so that's urination at night or waking, awakening from night to have to urinate. Um, you're going to see that with these types of patients as well, but why? Why would you see it? Well, these patients have a fluid build, build up systemically. And what happens is these patients actually lay down, they go to sleep, and that allows that body fluid to go throughout their whole body a lot easier through this uh, sy system because that dependent fluid that might have been in their legs is now able to travel with gravity across their body, which then goes to the, the, um, the kidneys and allows them to actually, their kidneys to excrete more fluid and actually process that fluid. Patients with heart failure may or may not necessarily have a problem with their kidneys. Yes, they may be in kidney failure, but that may not be the primary problem that they're having. That's kind of a, a concept for you to understand. So let's look at a couple more things with right-sided heart failure. Right-sided heart failure, if I look at this, here's my fatigue guy for a sleepy guy, fatigue, but I could see ascites, and we've got this um, iced tea um, ascites man. And ascites is, is a buildup of fluid in the belly, um, and there's lots of – I can go into a whole topic about ascites, um, but it's, it's a fluid buildup um, systemically with like um, – your liver and your spleen, and you end up with hepato and splenomegaly, hepatosplenomegaly as well, um, uh, termed together. Um, but most importantly, primarily with right-sided heart failure, a very early thing is weight gain. Now, um, definitely something that's pointed out to me earlier, a, con a confusion point. So left-sided heart failure, if I think about left-sided heart failure, left-sided heart failure backs up the blood into the lungs or fluid into the lungs, and then that fluid backs up into the right-sided heart failure and causes right-sided heart failure. But what's one of the very first things that you see with right-sided heart failure? Weight gain. So if left-sided heart failure causes it to back up through the lungs, then you're going to see weight gain with both left and right-sided heart failure. But which one do you see it first with? right-sided heart failure, and we're going to get to that point in later, but we can go over the question. So this is just the Picmonic again, showing um, actually the entire, uh, all the assessments for right-sided right heart failure, the image put together, and um, which our Picmonic learning system can really guide you through to show you. So um, let's think about, excuse me, high output heart failure, and this is definitely something that a lot of students really struggle with. Because it says high output, I mean, doesn't that mean that there's lots and lots of output, right? Like, it's fine. No. So what I want you to think of, high output flu heart failure doesn't it, – it basically what it means is the, the, um, you're unable to meet the metabolic needs. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means you're pump, you may be pumping a normal amount of volume out, but that may not be um, necessarily oxygenating properly. So let's just look at this for just a second. So the blood's the blood, the pump itself may be pumping okay, 
but it's not able to adequately oxygenate the red blood cells or the um, or not adequately able to carry oxygen to the tissues. And this is a very common case in severe anemia. So you have a very low RBC red blood cell count or a very low hemoglobin count. Hemoglobin carries oxygen. Well, if you don't have any hemoglobin, you're not able to adequately oxygenate the tissues. And that's exactly what happens very often in high output heart failure, a very severe anemic patient. These patients come in with a hemoglobin of six. What do you want to do for those patients? Hemoglobin of six? What's the first thing you'd be thinking? Blood transfusion. Patient with hemoglobin of five, six, you should be thinking blood transfusion. Those patients have to have those packed red blood cells to get that hemoglobin back in there to really be able to oxygenate the tissues. The only fix for it. Um, those patients, if you had a low hemoglobin, you couldn't just give you know, um, normal saline to because you're going to increase the tank volume, but you're actually increasing the amount of hemoglobin that is able to oxygenate the tissues. Um, and exactly this is the same thing, similar problem happens when you can't oxygenate fast enough, and that's what's going on here. And so how does that work? So the, the heart's pumping normal, or maybe the heart's pumping very fast, um, like in hyperthyroidism or thyrotoxicosis. Um, a patient's heart's pumping, you know, really fast, boom, 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 pumping very fast. And what happens is if it pumps really fast, it goes through the lungs so fast that it can't pick up the oxygen and take it with it. Maybe it misses, um, and it's not able to oxygenate the hemoglobin adequately, and then it doesn't work. So that's a high output, a very high output on cardiac, um, cardiac output itself, but a very low actual oxygenation of the tissues. That's high output card, heart failure. And the last thing is AV fistula. Um, so this is an arteriovenous fistula, and um, usually you can kind of think of this as in babies with um, problems of uh, congenital type problems where there's a um, – what happens is the, the blood is actually able to bypass the lungs. So maybe you have a hole in your heart. You always hear about a hole in the heart with babies or, hey, you know, Joe Schmuckatelli has a hole in his heart. And that's – what happens is actually the, the blood is able to go from the right ventricle to the left ventricle straight through the heart, and it's able to skip the lungs. And if it skips the lungs, it never picks up its oxygen, and without its oxygen on board, it can't oxygenate tissues, and that's kind of exactly what happens. It can't oxygenate the tissues fast enough, so these people end up with compensatory problems. And what – the number one thing that's immediately going to kick in here? Increase heart rate, tachycardia. Right. If you can't oxygenate fast enough, the – you know, if the spinning wheel can't go around fast enough, what happens is the spinning wheel, if, if the same red, if you only have a thousand hemoglobin molecules and they can only oxygenate the tissues, well, the body tries to spin those molecules up, and hopefully this blurs on your screen to see that it just tries to spin them up and tries to oxygenate the exact same molecules faster um, so that those molecules can try to oxygenate the exact same tissues over and over and over faster. But unfortunately, it can only be done so at such a high rate. Um, so hopefully that concept really solidifies in so you really understand. So you have your pipes, which um, really can vasodilate. And we talked about those. And then you have the pump, the heart itself, which can only move so much volume itself um, and stroke volume out each time it, it, it contracts. And then you actually have the tank or, and the blood that goes in the tank, um, the tank and the tank volume and the blood um, itself. So those components actually tell you about normal blood flow, and if you know those basic components, then you can also take the components, put them together, and see that if the pump is broken, that you can constrict the pipes and increase oxygenation to help problems. So this is a very important um, concept if you see patients with chronic hypoxemia. Chronic hypoxemia, so a chronic oxygenation of the blood that's low, what do you, what's something you see with those patients? So Let's give a good example here. So a patient who lives at an altitude of 20,000 feet, let's say that's um, possible, or 12,000 feet, a high oxygenation, a high-level altitude patient, living patient, we know that the oxygen that they're breathing is less in oxygen, so the body has to compensate for it. So what happens? Maybe it's a little bit um, too advanced for today, but we're going to go over it really in-depth with the respiratory lecture, and it's the fact that what happens is you increase the amount of hemoglobin, you, con you compensate. You increase the amount of hemoglobin that can go in the body. You have these high levels of hemoglobin because they can go and pick up as much oxygen as possible out of the lungs to compensate, and that's where you think about these concepts. You're going to be able to get it. Dehydration. My tank's low. What am I going to do if my tank's low? Well, I'm going to increase the amount that that tank spends, the same amount of fluid to oxygenate my tissues. Respiratory, respiratory, respiratory. Respiration, increasing oxygenation. That's the way you need to be thinking. So let's look at some quick interventions to kind of tie all these same things together. And it's kind of the exact same thing I just said. So what's our main priority? 
Priority number one, increasing oxygenation to the tissue. Number one, increasing oxygenation to the tissue. Respiration, right? Re airway, 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 like you should be thinking about that. And you should think about increasing oxygenation to the actual tissue. That's exactly what you should be thinking. So if you think about this general concept, well, ways we can increase oxygenation includes respiration. That should make sense. Another thing we do, increase functionality of the pump. And I'm just going to reword this exactly in the next slide. So if my pump is the problem, then I want to make my pump work better. And the other thing is I can reduce the over, overall fluid volume in heart failure because I know that very often I end up with an excess fluid volume or I have an increase in what? Hypertension. I have an increased pressure, so I can decrease the pressure by decreasing the fluid volume, which then allows me to pump a better, a smaller amount of fluid. Okay, so interventions, and this is definitely something I really wanted to get into. Good for you to really kind of tie it all together. And uh, as you can tell, I get really excited with a lot of these, um, and I'm I'm actually kind of mad at myself that I didn't get to make very many corny jokes because you like a lot of corny jokes in this um, to really kind of um, tie it all together so you can really get it. And so number one, what's the first thing we want to do? Respiratory support. So what's the easiest thing you can think? Let's think back to our left-sided heart failure patient. Um, left-sided heart failure, you're going to see these patients. Mary Smith again. Remember Mary? Oh, poor Mary. How many pillows she have to sleep on at night? Two, maybe three, so that she doesn't wake up from the night with paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or coughing at night or waking from the night with difficulty breathing. What's We ask her about that, but what can we do for her? Well, Mary, maybe you need to sit up better. Maybe you need an extra pillow. Maybe you're relying flat, and that's exactly the way you need to think. You should be thinking easy before hard, so maybe I want to sit the patient up. Sit him up. You will hear me say over and over and over again, easy before hard. It's You can always intubate every single patient, but if we intubated every single patient as a nurse that we came along, does that make us very good nurses? Well, it gets the job done, but let me tell you, people do not like to be intubated, and they won't like it at all. So respiratory support, sit them up. Number one, sit them up. It's the best, easiest thing you can do, and I've got this shown here by this high foul um, little heart in the chair, so he's raising them up into a high fowler's position um, above 90 degrees. What's number two? Well, oxygen. We can apply oxygen. So Mary Smith maybe is having trouble breathing at night, and that's where you see these patients that end up on nighttime oxygen. They have their little nasal cannula, and that they have their nasal cannula, and they have to wear it at night. Well, why do they wear it at night? You should be putting this together by now because of orthopnea, because they lay flat. Mary Smith's laying flat at night, and when she lays flat, the, the pressure builds up into her lungs, causing pulmonary edema and this paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So she ends up having trouble breathing at night. Well, how do we supplement that? We can't intubate Mary Smith every night. I mean, that's just – we could, but that's not very nice, and Mary Smith wouldn't like it. I talked to Mary Smith, and she, she wouldn't like it at all. But we can give them oxygen to supplement the amount of oxygen that they get in the air every time they take a breath. So lastly, for a patient that shows up acutely, maybe there's an emergency room scenario. You've tried A and B. The last thing you could do is a mechanical type of ventilation where we actually intubate the patients um, and give them a mechanical vent ventilation show them by this little advanced airway. Um, and that's where maybe we'd give them um, endotracheal intubation or we would do a, um, a PEEP or a positive in expiratory pressure. So what is PEEP? Um, this was mentioned kind of earlier on our webinar uh, in case you missed it. So it's a positive end expiratory pressure, P-E-E-P. -E -E um, and we actually show it in Picmonic as an actual PEEP. Um, and uh, so it actually, every time the patient um, exhales, I exhale, um, our beautiful mic here probably gets rid of my breath. Um, that's the point of it. But you exhale, and when you exhale, it creates, it keeps just a little bit of pressure inside of your lungs when you exhale so that it doesn't let the alveoli collapse down on themselves. And that's definitely something that we use a lot with pulmonary edema. So if we can keep the alveoli a little bit um, little bit expanded, if they collapse down like this, um, like in atelectasis, um, then they can't expand back again, and that's definitely a problem. So moving forward, um, what's the next thing we can do? We can increase contraction, increase contractility. We can make our pump work better. Hey, pump. Hey, heart. Let's work, 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 work. Let's do better. Let's work harder. And what are some things we can do? We can do drugs. We know we can give some medications um, that can do this, and we can also do a couple other things. Think about it for a second. What can you do? There are two really good drugs. One that's first line um, or more of a, a sooner drug than the later on being able to increase contractility. And what is contractility? 
Contractility is inotropy. Inotropy. Um, so that's the ability to contract. Inotropy. So what are the kind of medications? Well, we can give inotropic drugs. What's the big one? Digoxin, which is a derivative of digitalis or dig. Um, so this medic, we have this little digital bowl here, which is what we use for digitalis, um, that allows you to show um, inotropic medications like dig digoxin. Um, so this inotropic medication, it actually increases contractility. Now, as a last line, what's another medication just as a little tidbit that you can use that increases contractility? Dobutamine. That's it. And we actually use dobutamine as a do-buddha, a do-buddha in um, Pikmonic. So it's this doughboy Buddha um, character, which I love. We have a whole dobutamine card. Um, beautiful little character that allows you to kind of remember that um, it increases beta um, it's a beta agonist. So beta receptors increases beta receptors to allow them to contract harder to make this inotropic um, type response. So there's also drugs, chromotropy. Chromotropy is like the time or timing. And there's also dromotropy, um, different ways to remember um, what the different things do for the heart. So something else we can do to increase contractility? Think about the reasons or the causes of heart failure in the beginning. We had cardiomyopathy. Maybe it's not beating hard enough. We need to give it dobutamine. At the, you know, if you have a cardiomyopathy, you're at um, end of life care, and we're going to put you on a dobutamine drip. Um, and you're going to have a constant drip of dobutamine to keep your heart beating as hard as possible for as long as possible. Um, digoxin, of course, is more first line. Uh, but maybe you had a heart block. Maybe you had a, a serious heart arrhythmia with a, a third degree heart block with the top of the heart. Electricity isn't talking to the bar that hot, and it just kind of is um, not talking, not out of sync then we're probably going to give you a pacemaker. And that pacemaker allows the top and the bottom to bump them, bump them, bump them, and beat in sync and give you more of a, um, more of a syn synchronized rhythm of, um, of cardiac output to actually increase ejection fraction itself. So the last, the third thing, we want to in decrease the workload of the heart. So to decrease the overall workload of the heart, the overall workload, what's the best thing we can do to decrease the workload? Decreasing the workload. Now, I know I put here remove fluid, but the most important thing, think about the causes. Anytime you think about these, you need to think about the underlying cause. And the underlying cause you need to think here is um, the ability for um, to decrease hypertension, antihypertensive medications. Um, so if we, if we actually can decrease um, hypertension, um, then we can decrease the cause and, and cause, fix the underlying cause of the problem. And that's where you see a lot of people with congestive heart failure on types of medications like ACE inhibitors, this ACE inhibitor, this ACE heart card with inhibiting chain right here. Um, medicines like beta blockers, this beta fish with blocks, as you see here. And then um, also, we um, give patients diuretics to decrease fluid volume. So you see, um, you know, Grandma, Mary Smith, she's left side or right sided heart failure. Um, I should have used a different name to make it easier for you, but you see somebody with right sided heart failure and their feet are swelling. You probably they probably mentioned well I need to take my my inner my pill my water pill to decrease my swelling in my feet and you hear that and that's exactly what you hear and those are those diuretics or these di rockets you can see right here and diuretics decrease um, they like a, a loop diuretic like Lasix or furosemide decreases the amount of fluid that's um, removed in the um, loop of Henle and that allows you to decrease overall fluid volume um, and you always want to think about um, the side effects with those of losing things like potassium. You see lots of these patients on loop diuretics and they lose lots of potassium and, and um, you see that as they, because they have a lot of fluid buildup so they can't get rid of it properly. Um, and that's just a whole other concept that we'll go over on a different day. So we give patients diuretics, but first line we give thiazide diuretics, which are a, a less, um, uh, less invasive uh, diuretic. So Here's our um, heart failure interventions card, which is kind of the exact same characters you see here um, that you, you, I've introduced to you, but kind of everything you're going to do for heart failure as a whole. But if you think about it, if you have a patient who's having left-sided heart failure, they're going to end up with left-sided left problems, which is going to be respiratory problems immediately. Those respiratory problems end up equating to the fact that you need to set them up. How simple is that? That sounds so simple, and it really is. Give them oxygen. Yes, but you're going to sit them up before you give them oxygen, and that's exactly what you want to do. Grandma needs to lay on three pillows before we would actually put her on oxygen every night, and then we maybe think about an acute scenario of putting them on an advanced airway, and that's that's the whole idea you need to think. We don't want to always jump to the, the advanced um, scenario. We always want to think easy before hard, 
easy before hard, and that's where you need to be thinking about that. So um, let's think about this um, together again. Let's just do a quick review. We want to understand the components. So we went over understanding pipes, pump, and the tank and, and fluid. So we got the pipes, which are our arteries and veins. We got our pump, which is the heart, and then we have the um, I forgot. I'm actually drawing a blank. So we have the tank um, itself, and our tank um, then actually holds our blood, and our tank is our body. Um, so we can have any problem with each three of those. And let's think about that for a second. So if there's a problem with the pump, and the pump is beating slow, we know that our pipes could constrict and create some vasoconstriction to increase the amount of flow that goes into the pump. And that's where we get preload before the heart and afterload after the heart. And as you think of this basic concept, what you're going to realize is you're able to add additional levels of concept on top of the basics. You got the basics, preload, afterload, ejection fraction, stroke volumes, all these extra things that go on top of this are so easy for you to understand once you understand how it actually works. And that's really what we're hoping you can do here. So if you think of heart failure, you really want to be able to identify the problem area. Uh, so we've talked about actually maximizing, identifying where the problem area is and how it actually goes in so you can get it. Um, so if we talked about left-sided heart failure, we know that blood flow backs up beside, behind the left side of the heart. Behind the left side of the heart, well, if I think body, right side of the heart, right side of the heart, lungs, lungs, left side of the heart, left side of the heart, body. So if the left side of the heart's a problem, it backs up in the lungs. And that's exactly how you should think. But if the left side of the heart isn't working, where does it back up after that? Well, it backs up into the lungs and then into the body. It just spills over. You know, the, the fluid, there's nowhere for the fluid to go if we can't pump it to the kidneys for the kidneys to get rid of it. And that's how you should think. You're putting it all over the interventions together. And my favorite, my favorite, my favorite, um, which I hope that I could mention to you guys on a live webinar, we had to um, decrease our uh, bandwidth issues and audio and everything that was crazy going on today is this is my favorite character, one of my favorite characters rather, and this is our Thai Cyclops. So our Thai Cyclops actually stands for a great medication called Ticlopidine, and Ticlopidine tells you that you should shower me with gifts. I mean, I'm just saying, um, there's your best corny joke that I have because um, I usually have lots of them, but I really wanted to um, really condense it down today to just go over the concepts. You had the concepts um, and you don't really – um, you're not distracted by all of my craziness. Um, whether that's good or bad, I'm not actually sure. But so, you went over the components, went over the problem areas, and we went over the interventions of how it actually works. Um, and that's exactly what we need to think. So we went over the um, understanding the components, identifying the problem areas and the interventions, and of course, you know, showering me with gifts because Ty Cyclops here for Ticlopidine actually said that's what we need to do. So. Let's look at this quick question. A 67-year-old female patient presents with left-sided heart failure. Which of the following signs and symptoms are most likely to be seen? Likely to be seen, select all that apply. So let's think about this for a second. So select all that apply question. Always immediately, you sh your anxiety level probably goes through the roof. And while you're thinking about it, I'm just going to take a quick little sip here. Wow. But this is easy. You know the concepts now. So as you know the concepts, you should immediately think left-sided heart failure, and I think, wow, left-sided heart failure. And I've actually included the picmonics here below you, our picmonic images that you um, – we're going to share a playlist with you so you can follow it. Left-sided heart failure. Left-sided heart failure backs up into where? Backs up into the lungs. So I should see lung-type problems. So let's look at these answers. Dyspnea upon exertion. Well, immediately, critically thinking, thinking – are you going to have difficulty breathing at rest or exertion first if you're having decreased cardiac output? Exertion. So that's a no-brainer right there. You're going to have that. So the next one, pulmonary edema, peripheral edema. Oh, so I immediately see these, and I see they're opposites, and that's exactly what I should be thinking. It doesn't necessarily mean that one of them is correct, but that definitely means that I know that there's pulmonary edema versus peripheral edema, so those are definitely two different places. So I should think about that. Um, so I know that I just said backs up into the left side of the heart, left, lungs, and I should sing mm, pulmonary edema. So one's right, two is definitely right. Three, not right because that's something else, right? Four, paresthesias. Hmm. Well, there's always going to be those distractors that you never want to pick. If you don't know what's not right, do not pick it, and I'm going to tell you that right now. 
paresthesia is pins and needles types um, feeling that's pins and needles. So your arm goes to sleep because you slipped on it, and you wake up and it's numb, and you feel that pins and needles, that's paresthesia. Um, that is definitely not anything that pops in with left-sided heart failure, whether you knew it or not. It's not right. Ooh, five and six, weight gain or weight loss. Now, remember what you thought about. If we had to pick one, would it be weight gain or weight loss? Well, we know that primarily we talked about right-sided heart failure having weight gain. But a patient with left-sided heart failure, if it goes from the left side of the heart to the lungs, lungs to the right side of the heart, right side of the heart to the body. So if it, you have left-sided heart problems, it causes right-sided issues. So you're very likely to see weight gain. You would never see weight loss. There is no scenario in heart failure where you'd ever even see weight loss um, unless – no, I can't even think of a horrible example right now of where you would ever see um, weight loss. Um, maybe if you were uh, somehow abusing drugs or something, um, that would only be a weird scenario where you'd have a heart attack and have heart failure immediately. But that's never any kind of scenario you would ever see on any kind of uh, exam-style question. So lastly, seven, JVD, jugular venous distension. Well, immediately, jugular what? Venous. So where do you see venous distension? Primarily, very quickly, boom, right-sided heart failure. You should think right-sided heart failure, you see palm, you see dependent edema in the veins. And in the veins, you have an increase in fluid. And that means JVD. Those jugular veins are just going to be bulging out there, especially when you lay them supine. So let's look at what are the answers again. Let's go over it one more time. Um, you're going to see dyspnea upon exertion. You're going to see pulmonary edema. You're going to see weight gain. Now, a lot of you are really probably confused. You say, well, weight gain is in right-sided heart failure. That's correct, but left-sided heart failure causes right-sided heart failure, and that's how you should think. So if I gave you this question and it was right-sided heart failure, the answer would be 1, 2, 5, and 7, right-sided heart failure, because you're always going to have difficulty breathing because they have decreased cardiac output. You, oh, I'm sorry. I actually said that wrong. You're going to have 1 – maybe I did that. I'm actually not sure. 1, 3, um, peripheral edema. Uh, five, weight gain, and JVD, jugular venous distension, because a patient with right-sided heart failure is going to always all have difficulty breathing. Every patient with heart failure, difficulty breathing. Why? Because they're not getting enough cardiac output total. They're going to have peripheral edema because of dependency, because of the vein buildup. They're going to see weight gain faster in right-sided heart failure than left, but you're going to see weight gain, and then you're going to see JVD. So this is why you see what very, 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 very high yield amazingly high yield question that you want to educate a patient with heart failure, congestive heart failure, CHF, left or right, to do every day in the morning when they wake up after they urinate that you're going to do. Hopefully that clued it in for you, daily weights, because daily weights are an indicator of how severe, how much fluid buildup that they have acutely, whether I build up a lot of fluid today, tomorrow, or a whole lot of fluid all at once. So every single day, these patients have to do their daily weights, and that's exactly what you need to be thinking. Daily weights on any patient with heart failure because that's going to allow how much fluid building up because in both left and right heart failure, you have fluid overload. So um, as always, um, this is just a quick review of everything we did. I skipped a – I didn't actually skip a few things, but I skipped a lot of our interaction that we usually have, but I wanted to make sure I went in and I recorded this right away for you guys so you make sure you missed it if you had any type of audio issues. Um, so um, normally um, our webinars go off without a hitch, but today um, not so much, and that's the, the beauty of um, everything. And one of the things that always came up to me when I was in nursing school – um, was that nurses really have to be prepared for anything because um, you don't know. Maybe there's going to be a water shortage at your hospital, and they're going to have to um, pump in water, and you're going to have to conserve water um, because, number one, no matter what, as a nurse, you always have to take care of your patients, um, and that's kind of a prepare for anything kind of thing and be able to improvi improvise. Um, unfortunately, um, I feel like some of my instructors always told me to improvise when they lacked instruction, but hopefully that's not your case. Um, but um, what what you want to do, if you have any questions, reach out to us at feedback at pickmonic.com, and uh, as always, we're here for you if you have any questions. We have lots of webinars, um, other topics that we are going to be doing um, and explaining for you um, and going over, but as always, reach out to us at feedback at pickmonic.com. All of the images that you learned today, everything you saw, um, all the heart failure topics, 
are available as an actual playlist where you can go through in our Picmonic learning system and memorize left from right. And that's the beauty of Picmonic is that we actually associate images that you have with a fact that you know so you can always remember it and solidify those facts for long term. So you'll be able to remember that ticlopidine is an antiplatelet drug, um, even though we didn't mention it today in this particular webinar. And that's where um, Picmonic is an amazing resource. Um, so if you have any questions, reach out to us at picmonic.com, and otherwise, have a great night.